Our guest speaker today, before I introduce uh, Sammy, I have a few words about this uh, lecture series, uh, which is supposed to shed light on classic and recent Nordic architecture. A few months ago, under the headline, No Tobia is less a warning than a prophecy of doom, the British magazine Architectural Review made a harsh attack on today's market-driven global mainstream culture making it still more difficult to tell the difference between the recent architectural trends in the cities across the world. Defining Notopia as a symptom of the fact that the edge of Mumbai will look like the beginning of Shenzhen, China, and the center of Singapore will look like downtown Dallas. They even claimed that you don't have to leave London to find Notopia. Without judging, one could say that now you don't even have to leave the city of Aarhus to get a glimpse of Notopia. In the harbor, you can find all sorts of styles. You can find Dutch pragmatism, new Nordic iceberg style, Swiss minimalism, large-scale curtain wall modernism on stilts, and some other versions of contemporary international styles. And if you turn your back against the old city, you might think for a second, oh my God, where am I? Is it a shame? Is it a quality? Is it a condition that we better have to get used to? Or are there other alternatives? These questions will, among many others, be discussed during this lecture series. We will take the freedom of being a bit conservative, when, for instance, Michael Sheridan gives us his version of the best of Nordic architecture, leading us through the traces of folks like Asplund's, Alsus and Jakobsen and Erskine's achievements. Or when Johannes, Johanny Palasma leads us through those characteristics of the Nordic culture, then in his opinion, give rise to the identity of Nordic architecture. From another position, Marie Vatum will question the idea of a certain Nordic identity. In her opinion, the essence of place is a stagnated idea that tends to write off the local and disregard the potential dynamics of the place. And isn't this exactly what Jens Thomas Arnfred and Tiny Stuen Vandkunsten have done when looking for social potentials in dense city slots or in a landscape's curvature? constantly haunting new architectural concepts for human engagement and interactivity created by radical ideas and cheap industrial materials. And that leads us to the raw, but not less its extravagant concepts of Jens Thomas Arnfred's Wunderkind student, Bjarke Engels, who have brought this strange mix between radical anarchistic ideas <clears throat> and pragmatic solutions to an extreme, yet still with the ideal of giving more to the place than you take. And whatever huge contrast you can imagine between the yes is more fast and doubtless Bjarke Engels to the distinguished thoughtful Swedish gentleman Johan Selsing, the ideal of giving more than you take is not less expressed in his architecture. However, it is not necessarily social demands or contemporary ideas of low energy consumption, cradle to cradle, or low carbon footprint that interests Johan Selsing, but rather how subtle tectonic and material awarenesses and some strange traces from music, poetry, and art can imbue architecture lasting values reaching back and forth in time. Like you will find in the works of one of Selsing's heroes, Sigurd Leverens. Which leads us to today's speaker, Mr. Sammy Rinsala, who is actually everything else but Leverens, Selsing, or Engels. But there is a, actually one coincidental uh, connection, yet another mentor student link in this lecture series that uh, occurred to me two days ago when I received an email from Johanny Palasma. P.S., he wrote. Sami Rinsala was my student and certainly, certainly one of the most talented students I have ever had anywhere. <laughs> 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 
Sami Rintala is internationally recognized as one of Scandinavia's most vital small-scale architects. He established the office Casa Grande and Rintala back in 98, which produced a series of acknowledged architectural installations around the world during a five years time span. These works combine architecture with a deeper understanding of materials, nature, and context, all within a crossover art field using space, light, and the human body as tools of architectural expression. In 2008, Rinsala started the office Rinsala Egertsson Architects with Icelandic architect Dagat Egertsson. The office is based in Oslo and Bordeaux, where Sami lives, northern Norway, uh, with activities spread over more than 20 countries and four continents. Rinsala Egertsson have expanded their practice to landscape installations, bridges, pathways, and numerous architectural assignments of which many have gained wide recognition for their tactile appearance and uh, distinctive architectural and spatial qualities. Sami Rinsala holds a position as professor at the NTNU Trondheim, and an, an important part of his work is actually teaching and lecturing in various art and architecture universities around the world. Teaching takes place usually in form of workshops where the students are challenged to participate in shaping the human environment in a released, once, uh, realized one-to-one -one situation. Sami Rinsala's work is based on narratives and conceptualism. The resulting works are a layered interpretation of the physical, mental, political, and poetic resources of the site. And actually, as a, one last remark, because I, but before I leave the word to you, Sami, is that Sami actually was an exchange student here at this school in one year, in 93 and uh, 94. But, uh, Please take the floor, floor, Sammy. Okay, thank you. Could you help me to find the oh, yeah. presentation? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's true. Um, most of it, <laughs> what he said now, <laughs> except the part with uh, being a very good student. I think uh, Johanny Palasma is a uh, real gentleman, so he would, he would uh, say so just to help me a bit. I wasn't a very bright student at all times. I'm probably not here either when I was spending my year in, uh, in uh, Aarhus, but uh, it was a very important, uh, important year. Anyways, and here is sitting one of my student colleagues today as well. So it's very nice to see that we ended up teaching both of us. Um, I thought I'd take a little bit of your time now to, to first explain how we are doing things and why we are doing things and then some examples of what we are doing and those examples being, um, I think I'm standing too close to this, although I thought I turned it off already, but I don't need to stand there. I try to find my situation here, which doesn't make it. Um, this is called positioning. You have to find the best place in the room. Uh, yeah. So today's uh, lecture is called something like Forest Matrix. Now it's very good. And uh, I talk about uh, shortly about two things, nature and culture. And then the lecture... Uh, People who ordered this lecture were calling it also revisiting the forest, which is a very nice way of saying it, so I put it there too. That's uh, probably true. I'm an architect and a professor in uh, Antianu and then visiting professor in some other schools. But we have also this company, Rintala Egertsson Architects, uh, in Norway. Uh, this, is, uh, this lecture series uh, is a very interesting one, and I'm, of course, really honored to be starting it for you about Nordic architecture. And uh, one could really say that we are Nordic because my pal Dagul comes from uh, here. I come from here. And uh, Wiebeke, the third member in our group, comes from here. And then we have our offices nowadays, like here. So we are kind of uh, cross-Scandinavian uh, equipment 
nowadays. So I'm the guy who lives in North Norway, and that's a very sad place. Uh, there's only rock and stone there, like you see. And uh, this is in the middle of uh, summer night, so it's very difficult to sleep when you have so much light. So people become, of course, depressed. <laughs> and in the winter, it's even worse because in the daytime, it's so much light that uh, it's shining your eyes and it's so dark that you become depressed again in the winter. <laughs> this is the view from my office window, so I'm depressed there. <laughs> and uh, there's no shop, so we have to find our food ourselves. <laughs> And when I get to work, there's a lot of uh, traffic jam in there. So it's like any big city, border. But um, seriously, one of our problems, what we have tried to face in our work, is that we, work, we have been working in many places on the planet. And uh, that has been interesting and nice. But at the same time, it has uh, put us finding that we are a bit weird people because we are coming from a Western civilization, we are very well educated. We are having this industrial background, everything is produced industrially almost, what we use. We are rich, whether we want it or not, and we are democratic also. And that uh, gives us a lens to watch at the world, which is really weird. It's very few people on the planet who have this, uh, but we do. And, uh, when you make architecture to other places, you have to remember that, that people usually lack one, of, one or two of these objectives. Another thing in our work, we have to try to be critical about our own culture, is to, to say that we call ourselves modern or contemporary architects or culture or art or whatever. But uh, actually, a word called primitive could sometimes be the much more interesting case because primitive cultures can be really precise about how they work with their own resources on a sustainable basis, is the word, while as advanced cultures can uh, become like a shouting of issues that are not important at all in our lives, and especially when you make architecture. One important method for me to learn architecture, I'm still learning, is to make uh, workshops with students, so we have been traveling quite a lot uh, in different places and doing things, um, designing and building them, usually 15 to 20 students and for two weeks. It's a very good amount of people and a very suitable time frame. But of course it has its limitations. At the moment, I, this is an old number, now it's 138 uh, workshops since 1999 when I became architect. But nowadays we don't travel so much anymore here. I have decided that we try to work in our own climate and solve our own problems instead of going somewhere here and try to solve, find some other problems we haven't uh, created. There is usually no problems here. We have enough problems here to solve. And this is the results of the workshops. Uh, they can be bridges or small cottages or towers or furniture or whatever, and we usually use wood, so I come back to that. The method of uh, workshop is uh, very easy, it's uh, easy to explain, it's uh, focused on the practice side, but it's only seemingly because uh, our modern understanding, of course, of uh, how our body works is that uh, we are either thinking or doing things, but uh, recent research on brains uh, and our systems show that we are thinking with our whole body and uh, very effectively when we are doing something and even more effectively when we are doing something together with other people. So the most easiest way for us to function is to work with other people and communicate all the time and kind of brainstorm while we are doing and testing things. And this is called workshop. Another thing we are trying to teach architecture and uh, do architecture, but uh, I have gone a little bit away from this idea of architecture as a kind of cultural phenomena, where it's symbolizing a certain level of civilization or what is good or what is bad architecture, and that it's an interesting discussion and, and that should happen all the time. But 
I think it's more important today to think architecture as a biological need, really, which is built inside us. Uh, we are animals as well, but we just have a very strong evolution happening inside our own, own culture. In one word, you could say that we are creating tools that actually are starting to shape us a long time ago already, so we can't tell how much of this is natural evolution and how much kind of cultural evolution. But still, it stays the same. We need uh, protection and, uh, and shelter and uh, all these places that architecture can offer us. This is because uh, we have been only two, three thousand years living in, within culture, cities, agriculture. While before that, maybe two million years, we were living in uh, nature, as part of nature. And all our systems, how we are kind of uh, observing and, and recording our surroundings, is based on this time here. So biologically, we are still here. Uh, we are learning pre pretty quickly when we are born. Uh, what kind of urbanism level we are living at and can read that too and it's important part of our reality. But we know so little about everything. We don't know 5% of other living creatures on the planet at the moment. That's an estimate. So 95 of them are still unaware. We don't know who we are living with on the planet. We know about the universe. We know at most 4% because only 4% of the universe is material like this while well, 96% is something called black materia. So in this room, 96% is something we can't touch or feel or record with our senses. It's a very interesting thought. And even in our own brains, we know 15 to 20% uh, uh, what the gray mass is used for. The rest, 80%, uh, is still uh, kind of unclear what it's used for. And uh, since it's the organ that uses most energy in our body, it's not there for fun only. And even our body weight, half of it is bacteria, so we are carrying around half of our weight who is somebody else than ourselves. So what I'm trying to say here is that we are part of nature and, uh, and that's it. And uh, what, when we think of the architecture being created as the, in the old system or previous system, it is including very important parameters what should be shaping the architecture. But there's coming more and more all the time, and it's almost impossible to understand all of them. Uh, there's uh, neurological findings, how uh, we actually record our surroundings, what I'm talking about already. There's uh, all other kind of ex economies. Our clients are different than earlier. There's uh, new kind of political polarizations and identities people have. They don't want to be something that our parents wanted to be. And you don't want to be like me, you want to be something else. So there's a kind of complexity which is changing all the time. So our work is not like it used to be. So it's almost Im impossible to teach how architecture will be when you guys are out. Um, and this uh, complexity is interesting and it brings me to the next uh, idea, which is the main thing of this uh, whole lecture. Um, mm, the more and more I have worked with teaching and architects, the more I start thinking that, uh, that um, we need something totally new in architecture. And I don't know what it is, but it's of course based on the fact that we need to be more ecological and uh, more economical in what we are doing and this plurality of challenges. But what it is, so I've, I've been thinking about the uh, forest for some reason. Maybe I'm missing home, Finland. But uh, there's something about it, because uh, especially um, modernistic spaces that are minimal and clean, they, they kind of imitate desert. This is from James Bond. Uh, and they become in this way kind of excluding life and uh, unwanted phenomena way. You know all this. It's an exclusive uh, uh, way of uh, making design. But in nature, this doesn't happen. Nature is kind of giving ground and positions to all kinds of germs all the time that just can exist there. So to imitate nature means that you have to allow pluralism, inclusion and collage. Collage is a technique which is interesting in the, in the world of art more. And I think it should be used in architecture as well to take something old and something new 
uh, something uh, wooden and something of metal and so on. This kind of pluralistic uh, space exists in uh, nature, in forest, and uh, maybe in some uh, informal spaces, like they are called, which shouldn't be romanticized at all. It's a hard place to live. But they start, uh, when, when there's no law or system, it starts imitating this kind of pluralistic space. So when you go to a forest, uh, you, don't, you don't see the forest. You just experience one part at a time. So you miss most of the forest. And that's the interesting part of it. But uh, since uh, enlightening times, uh, people have uh, wanted to know everything about, give every animal a Latin name, and uh, also our views have to be open so we can control things. So to be in a forest is not to be in control over things, but to know how to use the forest, so there's a big difference there. And if we very quickly look at the uh, research of, uh, of uh, sustainability, it's a bit uh, outside of this subject, but what these guys are trying to say here from the University of Wageningen is that uh, if you want to teach ecology to the next generation, which is you, you have to have spaces that are ecological. So without the school building that is not based on ecological principles, it's very difficult to teach ecology. So I don't know if this is an ecologically built school, but uh, that's the point. So we have to start making them very quickly so that the change happens quicker. So it's a task that uh, is on us already. And this uh, space has to allow all kind of pluralism and diversity. So the researchers of sustainability, the top researchers, are saying the same. We need spaces that allow pluralism, not exclusive modernism, like clean design. Design is bullshit. Survival is the next step, you know, how to make things uh, survive with nature. So this kind of thinking that forest is nature is understandable. It is nature, but it's also culture. It's uh, behind our architecture and all the temples in Greek and Roman times, they imitate forest. Because in the beginning, the Auguri, the Etrurian and the Greek uh, priests, they, they were using the forest, small uh, forest as a holy place. And only afterwards, this forest was uh, replaced uh, as a temple. So this is the start of our architecture and it comes from forest as well. Another thing, which is everybody knows already, is that the world is not like this anymore. It was maybe until the 80s or 90s that you are either global or local, but uh, there should be actually local. It's a new word. But within every small locality, there's a global understanding of issues. So you could, in other words, you could be anywhere and still be globally connected because of our communication and traveling and everything. So you don't need to live in uh, Paris and New York to make an uh, important uh, part of the modern culture at the moment. So maybe, maybe there's a connection there that uh, when we are coming with all our symbols and architecture and biological selves from this kind of surroundings, we could have some kind of future that imitates it, uh, acknowledges its cultural past. And I don't know what that means, but it's an interesting thought that instead of trying to make things more and more simple and, and correct, we do something which is totally wrong. So we make a really pluralistic and chaotic space. But it's not only that, it has to be something else. It has to also participate on a technological level. So it's a kind of controlled nature, garden nature, uh, some kind of paradise where we were t thrown away a long time ago. Uh, so we, we can't know, of course, paradise means world, a secret garden. So it's in a way it's still here, but uh, we can't build it again. So we have to learn how to do it. Interestingly enough, in the popular culture, uh, things are going to forest nowadays. But the forest in th those films is a place where bad things happen. So it's a place where cruelty and bears are attacking people and eating their ass off. But uh, normally bears run away when they smell human beings, so it's not so. We have forests mostly here on the planet where we are living. 
in, in a Nordic context. We are part of this. We always talk about saving these and these, but actually we have the biggest forests here. And when we go closer, we see that there's some countries that have a lot of forest. Interestingly, so Slovenia here. Denmark not so much, but you are neighboring here. And Norway either. But it's, it's here around and it could be. This is, was very vastly pop, uh, forested areas earlier. Interesting things about nature and forest especially is that if you have a forest, this is the amount of species there. If you have a meadow, another culture, here human made, you have uh, this amount of species. If you make a net between them, the species richness uh, goes up depending on uh, what kind of biotype you are. It says that human intervention in uh, nature is only adding to nature. And that's why garden is, is so good, good idea. So we don't have to be afraid of uh, intervening nature, not to say that it's a kind of museum we can't touch. We have to garden nature. And that's where architecture maybe becomes an interesting tool. It shouldn't be left only to wood industry. So we have to try to make this happen is my opinion, that you have a chain of uh, different kind of people, there's architect is probably here, yeah, and uh, start cultivating our, our nature around us and, and make it part of our architecture. So, so that we will rather take the city to the forest than the forest to the city, if you know what I mean. There's some trees planted on the uh, central square next to the uh, church here, which looks a bit pathetic because uh, it's like a it's a forest, yeah. But um, this is where I live in North Norway. There's still uh, some people who make boats of uh, forest, of wood, and, and that's very interesting because they can already see in the forest which part of which tree is best for this part and so on. And we have lost a little bit of that tradition, which includes using these kind of tools. This is Japanese uh, tools. In our workshops nowadays, we use hand tools only, not any more power tools, because that way every student can work much more with their hands and not just one cutting and everybody else watching the one cut with the power tool. So, and, and we are, with 20 persons, we are much quicker with hand tools than uh, 20 persons with power tools because of the division of the work. It's very interesting. That, could, that being said, it's, uh, wood is very, democratic material because it allows you to work with very simple tools that doesn't cost so much and it allows everybody to work on the same level. I'll give you a couple of examples of uh, workshops. This is uh, last week I came from uh, this place, Flainvar, it's an island in front of Buda. It looks like this, very sad. And uh, we started two years ago already building it, so we have had like four or five workshops there. And uh, doing pretty complicated things uh, in a terrain which is very difficult. We have to tie down a building in a place where the wind can be up to 50 meters a second. So we don't want our building to be the first one to fly in the wind, so then the locals would be really happy and ironic about us, our work. So we have students from uh, France and Italy and Spain also learning how to build in the Arctic climate. And this is the end result. It's a kind of series of small buildings that is used for writers and composers and painters to live on the island, these uh, residency programs. And they have, of course, a sauna, which is a sign of civilization. So they are wooden small buildings that are built on site here and uh, create a kind of small urbanism in between them as well, which is very important to create microclimate in this clim um, climate, with very windy and very e easily cold here. But uh, every time we are working with students, we, we make food together and uh, eat local food. So last workshop I shot two seals. I'm an ecological architect, but I believe that uh, it's more ecological to eat seals than pigs in where I live. So I said to my students that everybody who eats meat has to come to see when I'm taking the seal uh, in pieces. And then we grill it here. And uh, it's a fantastic meat and totally ecological. 
uh, that's the, what I mean about harvesting and gardening nature is the food is there and we have to take it it's much better to know where it comes from and so so we'll try to teach this to our students as well so we don't always kill something we also pick berries and mushrooms and and fish well that's killing mm. this is one of the cottages it's a kind of a expressive uh, one leg thing it uh, reminds of the Sami people's uh, place where they used to keep their food so that the beasts couldn't go up and eat their meat and so called Nyalla. We are working in this project together with the office called Tuin Architects, young Norwegian architect studio who are my ex-students so they are more expressive than I am but I have to, this is called pluralism. <coughs> this is the view from this tower. Then the main building where we have kitchen and uh, performance uh, practice space with uh, all types of wood what we have got. We make uh, tables and benches out of leftover pieces by gluing them together. And this is a place where you have two beds, one here and one here. So it's pretty slender, slender and then we have to anchor everything down because it's very windy inside testing different kind of uh, materials inside and also making the landscapes and so on. The more and more I work the more I start thinking that if you forget to design the outdoor areas in between the buildings or next to the buildings you you fail a little bit because this is part of your architecture. It's a very important part of it. It shows you how you approach and use this building. Without this this building would be pretty nonsense but now it shows how it how you walk next to it and we test also materials outside this is uh, burnt shingles so chopped uh, pieces of wood that has to be right size and put in a right manner and then burnt so it, it stays this is sea already so the waves are hitting the building sometimes and yes sauna even some drawings this time. So we built this in 10 days with students, the sauna and the dressing room, uh, using again uh, leftover pieces of wood here. It's a good thing to have in the cold climate, sauna. And this again, a couple of uh, sad pictures of North Norway in the dark time. Uh, sometimes very disturbing light phenomenon. <laughs> Some projects are <coughs> recycled like this German uh, architecture from the 40s. It's a bunker so we we don't always make a sauna but this is also a sauna. <laughs> and we used uh, logs to make a kind of zigzag inside the bunker so it's dividing the space into dressing room and uh, washing room and, and sauna room and then doing uh, all the furniture and everything ourselves too and then leaving some of the engineering left here. It was very well done concrete because it's uh, 60, 70 years old and, and the <coughs> inclination of the floor is one centimeter per meter exactly. So the water when you throw the water it goes in a certain speed uh, towards the place where it should be. So. And yeah, this, everything is uh, designed and built by students all the time. So I would state that this is really quick and good learning for students to learn how the material behaves and uh, see the results. And the best thing about workshop is that you can fail and still succeed. So you even learn from the mistakes. But so far I wouldn't say we have really failed in any workshop. Sometimes we'd make more like uh, general comments this was uh, in Munich the biggest uh, handcraft show every year and we made a system for the refugees it was an item at that time very heavily so we had to make our own comment how to make quick uh, buildings out of this kind of six centimeter thick plywood so we made a kind of Lego Lego system uh, where rooms are one size so two guys could carry one room and put it on place and then we made a two floor high uh, test uh, system out of it in four days with the students. 
with some uh, signs not not making any surfaces but just to show how the spaces could be and then we won the first prize of 200 uh, exhibition stands uh, professional people from germany and switzerland and so so it was quite nice for the students to get this gold medal here but we also make uh, traditional stuff so in uh, west norway we recently made a 1800 century style uh, building using interesting techniques recycling logs and making clay and you use the logs and the clay together so you use the wood as bricks i'm sure you have this in denmark as well uh, traditional this technique but more north is not so used very very much used so we made one building in two weeks using very old techniques and hand tools again making all the furniture ourselves and a two-ton uh, oven. This is uh, called uh, Eldhus. So they use these kind of buildings for drying wood or, or um, hay and stuff that needs to be dried for winter. So not only design, but also like reviving old techniques and seeing if they could be used in a modern way or in a new sense. And then this is in action. Very quickly, maybe some of our projects, just to show what kind of... Uh, I'm almost 50 now, so it's nice to look back a little bit. We, I started much more with this kind of political art. I was a young, angry guy, or interested in politics much. And, and so I, we made this kind of uh, show how the, even the old buildings are following people to the cities, because everybody moves to cities. In Finland, it was a very strong movement at that time. Plus, my last work in Aarhus uh, was uh, three walking houses and a harbor. And uh, Svein Turnsager, the teacher, said to me, that's impossible. You should think of some other profession than architect. So my first work was to make three walking houses, just to show. <laughs> it was one, one behind there, but just to show that uh, it's not impossible. And then we burned them. Uh, in the end uh, to show that this is not a happy story this thing so there was a dancer and performance and uh, this kind of performance uh, art thing uh, prevailed very long so we were in venice biennale making a floating garden in a boat uh, 22 oaks and made a system how to uh, make soil and uh, make it work for a lifetime the interesting thing is that we calculated how much uh, human waste shit Venice produces per one hour and we took that amount of shit and composted it and made this garden out of Venetian shit so it's when you go to the last room it says that you are standing on top of one hour's worth of human waste from your own city so everything you throw you could recycle this boat was we found it in the Laguna drowned so we welded it together and uh, recycled the boat so everything was recycled just to say that instead of uh, throwing things you can you can make a beautiful car out of it. and uh, all kind of uh, art installations uh, sending birds nine kilometers high <coughs> carrying seeds so lots of artworks even performances like this we were closing traffic in uh, san juan and making citizen gardens of uh, crashed auto parts, car parts, so to show the, the kind of uh, problems of this uh, heavy car traffic here. We were masquerading as a voodoo parade, so the police uh, didn't dare to stop us because we have a, this voodoo mask, so they thought we can curse them if they stop us. <laughs> and then more back to architecture, first uh, pavilions, this is called Element House in Korea with steel and, and wood. I didn't build this myself with the students because this is built by the local builders, but this we build ourselves in Oslo, box home, commenting on the apartment situation in Oslo and many other cities that you have very small apartments that cost too much, so nobody has money to buy them. So we build in three weeks, one fourth of the price, we build a functional apartment that you could live in just to show that it's still possible to do it. So, 
and some other small projects. The world's smallest hotel in Kirkenes. It's uh, with uh, single room, double room and lobby. The lobby is for meeting people. And uh, you don't need any curtains because there's no neighbors. The next neighbor is in Alaska. Or televisions because there was whales and seals and Russian submarines here. So this was also burned in the end because the, <laughs> the rental time went off. This is the client, so it wasn't against uh, her will. But we, we didn't have any more time to keep this here. And you see there's also fire brigade. <laughs> so. But nowadays we don't burn our buildings anymore. But it's part of the performance. This burning also was a cultural happening where we had a Russian composer to make a very nice music. Uh, we have also started to make bridges. This is the uh, first one of them in uh, West Norway, in a very humid and cold place, so we couldn't use wood so much, which is always a pity for us. But then again, the local builder uh, was very good at concrete, so we got very nice concrete work here. The idea of the bridge is that there's a room in the middle that is acoustic, so there's a very strong sound of the, of the water here, kind of uh, suction sounds. And we wanted to enhance that in that room, so it's a very interesting. You are standing in the air and have this uh, vibration of the water with you. And then a small room for uh, school classes to have a, a pause. In Norway, they eat uh, lunch outdoors often with this kind of place. But like I said, uh, the work of the local company was very good. Usually a bit problematic in Norway to find uh, good concrete work, but this was very good. And this is a winter picture. Uh, after that, we have already made two new bridges, but I didn't uh, have the material. One funny project in North uh, Sweden, this is Nordic uh, area, and this is very cold area called Harads in North Sweden. This is the area where they come to test the uh, newest Audi and Mercedes-Benz cars in winter conditions, because it's always, every winter, you have minus 30, minus 35. And then this one family wanted to create a, a place called Tree Hotel in the middle of uh, nowhere, really. And there wasn't many fine views or anything, but their idea was to take a forest and change it into a hotel and put uh, things hanging in the trees. Um, I was very much against it first. I thought, I, I don't want to use living trees to attach a building, which is a kind of first reaction. But it's wrong in a way, because what happens with these trees then is that they are cut down, sawn into pieces, glued together again, and uh, you get the same uh, stability, structural stability and capacity than this uh, 30 centimeter cir circ uh, in circumeter wood in uh, this size of a glue lamp beam. So it's crazy to use so much energy to, to make much worse building material. So why not to use uh, locks? And living trees, we have a system how to attach here, so it's opening every year, you can open it. So the site was uh, very special. The client wanted to have a very big building with uh, three sleeping rooms and a, kit, uh, a toilet and a meeting room. So it was a bit difficult to hang it in the trees as well, but we made this kind of uh, balancing act. So it was balancing between six of these trees. You see the detail here. Attached. And this building weighs uh, 22 tons. Uh, and it's uh, carried by these six trees. But one of them would have been enough to carry it as a weight if it wasn't any sideways movement. So it's amazing capacity these trees have if they are not cut down. And the exterior was uh, chosen to be cordon steel. It's a color of the pines as well, so it's the same color. Uh, we could uh, <laughs> design our own lamps too, which is a rare issue nowadays. Everybody is in such a hurry that there's never time for these kind of things, but the more north you go, the more time people seem to have. <laughs> <coughs> uh, yeah, Kate Moss was uh, sleeping in our hotel. <laughs> I was fishing. Um, we have used wood also in... Uh, five-story high 
tower in uh, South Norway in a place where it's flooding. And so there are, uh, this is the flooding times and the, this is our construction site. So we had to come with the boat to the construction site. The interesting thing with this uh, location is that uh, this is like Loch Ness, this uh, lake. It's called Seljur Lake and they believe or they know there's a sea monster there. So we had to make this observation post for the sea monster. <laughs> and that's why maybe the form became a little bit like a fin in the back. And then again, very important thing, how to connect, how to make these small things. We had a very good uh, landscape architect of his uh, Feste studio in South Norway helping us with this. And wood everywhere. And then uh, view from the top and then lightning in the night. It's very important in north how you light the buildings in the night. Now when you have these nice lamps that don't use so much energy either. A bus stop in uh, Austria. Again, very much based on the local building industry using shingles. So we wanted to do something which is traditional and modern at the same time maybe, if you wish. And at the same time, we wanted to be a bit humoristic because there was a tennis field. So while you are waiting for the bus, you could climb here and watch the tennis game as well. So it became part of the feature. The tennis club was very happy of this uh, connection. This project was a um, very interesting one because they invited six or seven offices from around the world, like uh, So Fujimoto and... Uh, was um, Alexander Brodsky from Russia. And uh, all of them had to make for free everything. And uh, it was such a nice invitation that we realized that we need to do it for free for them. So, and the way they were tackling this was that they made really nice models of those buildings and uh, exhibitions and everything. So this kind of project should be more that you, you just invite people to come and work together because it's a, such a good idea. You don't need to use so much money after all. A very good uh, use of material in this area. When I earlier showed the picture of the culture of wood, how the forest owners to the users should be linked, it happens in one place in Europe, and that's called Vorarlberg in uh, Austria. So if you want to go and see good wooden architecture and good wooden culture, go and have a visit there. Uh, there's a lot of good architecture, but also like traditional architecture. And you should not only see architecture, but also the guys who are doing the sewing and the, the carpenter places, because they are like architect offices, really. They are so nice, uh, precise uh, places where people have pride on their own work. For Alberg in Austria. Then we have uh, lately participated in some uh, cultural programs. This one was in, uh, created by our client Erlen Muger Larsen. He wanted to take a big culture show in North Norway and make portable, transportable structures that can house thousands of people, big concerts and sauna and, uh, of course, and uh, food and all kind of things. So we created this kind of Arctic pyramid, he calls our client, and uh, reproduced uh, many of them. This is. Chinese video artist uh, Fadong, his work in the Arctic, fantastic uh, combination, collage of art and structure and uh, nature here. Yeah. So one summer it was there, <coughs> people were visiting there. Again, some things. And the sauna, of course, this is a four cylinder sauna <laughs> for 80 people. It was really cool. So we had uh, lectures and uh, small concerts here as well, so people could sit here. Yeah. And the view is quite nice. Yeah. Now it's in Oslo, so if you go to Oslo, it's uh, starting after Christmas. I think we will uh, start having concerts and stuff. So when you sit in the sauna, this is the view at the moment. It's quite nice. At the same time, we again made smaller things, uh, small cottages for people to sleep in for free and so uh, with the students. And uh, we draw also one um, recycling toilet uh, shower place for the people visiting there so that there wouldn't be too much garbage or human waste on the beach. 
So this is still present there. It's, the project was called salt and this is called pepper. So the pepper is left. And some projects we are working with at the moment. We have a lot of this kind of small scale tourism project in North, North Norway because the possibilities for tourism are there are huge because they have really nice uh, nature and landscape, but it should be done in the right way, in a small scale. Then we are working with the boat museum in my hometown in Bula. That's our biggest building so far. They start building it now. And then some small uh, um, remaking of uh, old houses into living houses for families, cottages and such at the moment. Um, and for the final remark, there's some reading list. This is about forests, what I tried to talk a little bit. It's an ongoing idea in my head, so I'm not ready with anything, but it's a very interesting book to read um, for architects. If, you, if there's one book you should read here, connected to workshops, it would be The Craftsman here by Richard Sennett. Very interesting about how we are thinking with our whole body and not just with the head, how we have to be more total with our way of making things and thinking about things. And finally, maybe generally, I think every, every architect should read the, um, yeah, now I lost it. There was a <coughs> book by Jared Diamond called uh, The World Before Yesterday. So you should write that down, or maybe you can take a snapshot of the whole thing. Now you get the very fast show of the, all the pictures. So. I'm so proud of this. Kate Moss. Yeah, here. So there's, uh, in times when the technology doesn't work, you go to old fashion. This is uh, Jared Diamond, The World Until Yesterday. It's a very interesting social anthropology book about how civilizations work and architecture is a really important part of that book as well. Thank you very much for your patience and I... It's okay to ask something if you want. Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, thank you for a very nice lecture. Uh, it's really interesting to see how you work for the interior, which is very nice. Another thing that I found interesting was how you work with the gravity in the, in the work, or maybe you could say you work against gravity. A lot of the projects that uh, the cantilevering in the almost blind out. It's a good observation, of course, but uh, I think what is nice about uh, structures is that you can do many things with them, and they can be very economic structures. So it's a kind of low-tech uh, fun that you can make uh, this uh, hanging piece on top of the other in element house. It's a balcony. Any balcony you see in the buildings is that tra structure. It just lacks the house behind it. So it's a very cheap way of making a balcony. But just, uh, so I like this kind of... Uh, Finding, refining the structural qualities that you, you can actually make something that looks a bit uh, extraordinary or interesting or expressive by using a very low tech. So you don't need to, it's not cantilevered, it's actually standing there. And, uh, but uh, I think we are not so interested in trying to make things fly because we usually use quite thick uh, structures to express the the carrying capacity and maybe more and more nowadays when we use wood we want to use quite heavy timber more and more for some reason and maybe because it's also insulation and, uh, but moving architecture floating and uh, that kind of thing i find very interesting so we have done a lot of floating workshops last was in estonia in august where we made uh, free floating objects 
on the river in, the, in the Soma. So yeah, mo moving and, and nothing is anyway permanent, so it's kind of a movement anyway. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I got carried away. Yeah. Are there any other questions to Sammy? Like I said, this whole thing about forests and uh, pluralism and everything, it's an idea that a kind of obsession. So I don't know how to solve it, so I'm kind of leaving it all to you. Um, so what we are doing is, um, we are trying to follow pretty little what's going on in architecture at the moment, otherwise, and just try to take every project as uh, own discussion by itself. So trying to involve, make some kind of structural solution, a spatial solution. And of course, the spaces should be atmospherically and, uh, and just beautiful spaces, if only possible. So it's still our goal, but not to think of the architecture as some kind of uh, sign of anything else than itself, really. It would be really nice to think so. And now, you know, maybe when I move to North Norway, this idea of really sheltering things is important. If you have a three-day break in the electricity, uh, all the houses would freeze and uh, uh, you couldn't use them anymore because the water would freeze everything down there. So it's very precarious condition and our architecture is so full of technology that doesn't work without electricity that it's a bit frightening. So it's a kind of idea of uh, having diversity of architecture to support diversity of humanity in a diversity of spaces instead of all the everything becoming monoculture. So it's a human biodiversity supporting idea to have different kind of architects, different kind of architecture in different kind of places. Maybe what was mentioned in the beginning about Orhus Harbor being a collage of architecture. I don't know if it's a good or a bad sign of this, but something is happening at the moment. But instead of imitating architecture from other places, I think Every place should invent or reinvent their own architecture. That would be optimal. One could say, as an example, languages is a good expression of cultures. There's uh, 6,000 languages on the planet at the moment. 5,000 of them is, has less than 100,000 speakers. So only 1,000 big languages. In 100 years, they estimate there's 1,000 languages left, 100 big ones and 900 small ones. 100 years ago, there were 60,000 languages on the planet. So every two weeks, dies a person who is the last <laughs> representative of his or her own culture or civilization. And that means we lose like a way of cooking, way of making houses from the local stuff and way of understanding the universe, literature, poetry, music. We are becoming similar. Everybody listens to the same music, have the same clothes live in the same and work in the same kind of buildings. I'm not saying is it good or bad, but it's dangerous because when you pull the plug, the buildings on the uh, Dubai and in the Arctic, when they look similar, something will happen to either of them or both of them. Yes, are there other questions in the audience? Maybe, maybe one last question or a question from me. It'd be, um, there's almost half of the school students gathered here today, and uh, what, what would be your, your advice as a young architect to be aware of in this kind of global, global uh, challenges we are, we are facing, or we are in today? Well, I have to comment on the young. This is the last time somebody calls me young for what so I have to enjoy. <laughs> um, I think uh, you just have to learn to to be strong and sensitive at the same time. Strong in the sense that you have to follow your own instincts and know what is the uh, right thing to do. And sensitive in the sense that you have to listen to the smaller voices in the project as well, not just the kind of uh, 
things you are, should be listening, but also other things. You, you are, we are very fine instruments and so we have to learn how to use this kind of uh, patience. We are very impatient culture today. So patience, architects, you need a lot of patience and sensitivity combined with strength that you carry on. But it's more like a marathon runner strength instead of weight after strength. So you have to be, have endurance and sensibility in your projects and, and listen, good listeners, not just convincing people all the time, but also listen to what they have to say and the place has to say and so It's a difficult thing to do, but to learn this takes a long time. And when you finally learn it, uh, I hope it's not too late. <laughs> Okay, Samuel Rinsele, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today.